So the opening salvo of the Marvel Cinematic Universe Phase 4 has just concluded its second box office weekend at its theatrical exclusive release, Shang-Chi. And after last week when I got, oh, let's say just a smidge of vitriol for my video where I claimed that Shang-Chi was a box office failure for Disney and for Marvel Studios for a variety of reasons, which I laid out in financial and mathematical detail in that video. Well, apparently a lot of people didn't like that. But I did appreciate them because they managed to get me monetized on YouTube, so I wanted to take a moment to thank them for that. But I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of go a little deeper. Let's talk about the movie industry in terms of its box office financial data, how it works, how movies have traditionally made money at the box office, how the costs work, the revenues work. Let's go into some of this discussion today, but more importantly, I want to talk about where I think this is going in the future because obviously in the last 18 months, there has been a tremendous change in the box offices and how these movies work thanks to video on demand services like Disney Plus and HBO Max. We're going to get into all that today. Stay tuned. Here we go. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, please make sure you hit that notification bell. And we're going to start off today with what I have on screen here. So we want to talk uh, about, you know, kind of how the movie industry not only has worked up to this point, but some of the big changes that I think are going to be coming in the years ahead. And we're seeing it start now. The problem is a lot of the uh, inside baseball information has not made it out the gate yet for us to know. And it might take another year or two before we do, but I can promise you things are not the same as they were in the theater versus movie studio uh, uh, di uh, dynamic that we had back just even in 2019 when big films like Avengers Endgame came out. So we're going to talk about that today. So on the screen here is a report from Deloitte, which if you're an accountant, you probably know exactly who Deloitte is. If you're not, you probably don't. So I'll give you a basic rundown. Deloitte is a very well-known, very reputable uh, accounting firm. They do accounting, they do tax, they do auditing. This is a company that generates around $20 billion a year in gross revenues. Uh, they're not small potatoes. And the reason they write, uh, write reports like this is basically because, well, they probably do a whole lot of accounting and auditing for, guess what, uh, the film industry, uh, among many, many other industries. So we're going to talk about this report today from Deloitte called Digital Media Trends. Now, one thing before I get into some of the details here, and we're going to go into you know, some of the, some of the uh, uh, data points that have involved basically movies for this year. We want to start with like Godzilla versus Kong and then run all the way up through Shang-Chi and talk about some of the differences and why it's so hard to gauge, why it's so hard to gauge where a movie is successful and where it's not because so much has changed in the last 18 months. So we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, but this report from Deloitte was produced in October of 2020. So Take into account when this was written. This was still being written using a lot of data points from the pre-pandemic era, the pre-lockdown era, you know, before movie theaters were shut down. This is where a lot of their data points came from because, of course, in 2020, there really wasn't anything open. There were no big movies coming out of movies at all. Everything had been sidelined or had been shunted to video on demand. So when we read this article, we need to bear that in mind, and then we're going to talk about why I think this is changing and where I think it's changing, and we're going to go over those data points as well. Okay, so we can see here uh, on the first page, and I want to just, just let's look, everybody look at the highlight real quick. On the first page of this research report from Deloitte, after the pandemic is over, it is unclear what role movie theaters will play in our consumer entertainment or to what extent the existing system of releases will have been disrupted. Well, I think we know at this point, again, this report was published roughly almost a year ago now. So we now have some 2020 hindsight with which to gauge where this came in. 
And we know there's been a lot of disruption, a lot of changes this year. We'll talk about some of these, you know, with studios like HBO Max or excuse me, Warner releasing all of their titles day and date on HBO Max. Disney kind of making a game time decision as each film comes up. Paramount really not doing anything with their stuff in terms of of uh, streaming release, except in rare, in rare cases. Uh, and Sony Pictures just consistently looking to sell their their movies to the highest bidder. So there's been a lot of differences between studios this year, and it's very difficult to take everything uh, into perspective from that standpoint. So, But the first uh, 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 paragraph here, one of the first paragraphs, I want to call this to your attention. Let's cover this. Studios derive almost half of their revenues from theatrical releases. Half of revenues from theatrical releases. Again, this is up to and in, up to 2019 and including 2019. Okay. Although the average number of movie tickets purchased by Americans each year has declined from 4.2 in 2009 to 3.4 in 2019, studio revenues are driven more by box office tickets now than they were 20 years ago. If theaters have a diminished role in the windowing system, the schedule of exclusive exhibition periods across theaters, home video, cable and TV, and streaming, it could force changes in how content deals are financed, what the terms for distribution look like, and how studios make money from their productions. Now, I want you to remember that through the rest of this video because that is key. And the Deloitte firm is 100% correct. And I can tell you right now, though we don't know what the details are them yet or are of these yet, we do know that absolutely there have been changes in contracts between distribution companies like Warner Media or Disney or Paramount or so on and so forth between them and the theatrical exhibitioners, people like AMC Theaters, Regal Theaters, Cinemark, Marcus Theaters. I could go on and on and on. The terms that they were able to negotiate before this year I can promise you, are not the same as they are now. And I'm going to tell you why, but let's keep going. Okay, so in the next part of the primer, also equally important to understand, to put things in context, into perspective, let's read this real quick verbatim. Although streaming may look like the obvious path forward, studios can't fully monetize all their franchises and derivative content through streaming services particularly if they don't control their own distribution channels. For those that do, deploying streaming services is very costly. Many have yet to show much profit, despite their expanding market valuations. Early experiments with premium video on demand, or PVOD, where first-run movies are offered directly to consumers on streaming services, have had mixed results during the pandemic. At the same time, if the pandemic were over, 68% of consumers want to watch at least some movies in theaters. Clearly, it's not as simple as just shifting to streaming. And that's a key metric as well. And again, this was in October of last year, a year ago when we were still in the height of the pandemic lockdowns. I would posit to you that that 68% number as things have returned to normal, we have seen evidence that people still really want to get out there. College football stadiums the last two weekends have been packed to the brim. NFL stadiums have been relatively packed as much as they can be depending on the locale they're in. Concert venues, things of this nature, they have all been very well packed. And this is much of the same core demographic audience that movie industries require and have been enjoying their wallets for decades. So where are they at the movie theaters? We'll talk about that as well. So when we look at this first graphic, this is where Deloitte has done their research and is talking about through their, uh, you know, through their research, through their uh, uh, polling data, they have come up with some numbers that they feel relatively confident in uh, through digital media trends on a, a COOF uh, a survey in October 2020. Again, about a year ago. So imagine a future where the pandemic has ended and the movie theaters are all open again. Where would you have a preference to see a movie? 20% at home, 13% at a theater, 22% uh, 
probably at a theater, 23% equally likely at a theater or at home, 22% probably at home. So if we take the at home to probably at home, that's about 42%, and the rest are either equally likely or more likely to still want to go see it at a theater, again, this is, I, I would I would bet that if if Deloitte redid this survey now, with with where we are now in this 18 month period coming out of this where obviously more people are far more willing to venture out to their favorite entertainment venues and we have seen direct irrefutable evidence of this in other areas outside of movie theaters and movies i think these numbers would be much different i think these numbers would probably be more favorable to going back to the theaters but there are some other things going on in Hollywood as well, which we have discussed at length on YouTube. And, and that part of that is, is Hollywood actually producing content that people really want to go see in a theater versus a bit of apathy. And, and hey, if it's available at home, I'll sit at home and watch this because I just don't care about this anymore. But when it comes to their favorite college football team, their favorite NFL team, other sport franchise – the concert, the musician, or the artist they want to go see, they're still apparently very willing to spend those dollars and go out and see those things in a major venue with packed crowds. So the movie industry may have more of an issue to deal with in terms of content at this point than anything else. So studios are very reliant on box office sales, which rose from 26% of total global revenues in 2000, excuse me, to 46% in 2019. With almost half of their revenues from theatrical releases, studios are understandably concerned about upending a century-old model in favor of digital distribution. And yes, they are. And even with 2020 and even with the experimentation on things like Disney Plus and Premier Access, WarnerMedia, HBO Max, which is a very different story than what Disney Plus has done. Very, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, yes, they are. Studios are realizing, as has been discussed many times, as I have said, if you watch channels like Midnight's Edge with my buddies Tom and Andre over there, it has been said there many times that, yes, indeed, theaters versus Hollywood studios, Hollywood studios are realizing that they need the theaters more than theaters need them. And this data research from Deloitte, again, a $24 billion a year revenue generating uh, public accounting firm giant, a juggernaut in the industry, absolutely concurs with this. And these are the guys that do a lot of tax accounting and auditing for many Hollywood studios. Studios typically release new movies to theaters with an exclusive window. A film cannot be shown on any other channel during the theatrical release. On average, studios share 45% of the box office revenue with the theater operator, meaning the studios will retain 55% of the grosses. The theatrical operators, that's AMC Theaters, that's Cinemark, that's Marcus Theaters, uh, all those guys, Regal Theaters, that, that, that whole, the, all those th uh, theater families, this is what we're talking about. They get to keep, on average, 45%. And the studios like Disney or Warner or Paramount, so on and so forth, keep the other 55. Again, averages. <clears throat> Most movies make about 75% of total U.S., not foreign, U.S., <clears throat> total box office revenue in the first 17 days, including the first three weekends. Yet, they can stay in the theaters for another 60 to 75 days beyond that to capture the remaining 25. The longer a movie runs in theaters, the more the revenue share shifts in the favor of the venues or shifts in the favor of the theaters. Again, remember that number. Remember that statement. The longer it stays in the theaters, the more those revenues shift to the theaters. And we are in a world where up to this point in 2020, when things radically changed, where movies would often stay in theaters for two, three, four, five, six months. Some as long as, as I mentioned in my previous video, The Greatest Showman, which ran in theaters for an a staggering, a staggering 53 weeks. 
That's not happening anymore. So you have to ask yourself, why would theaters agree to these same pre-pandemic terms? The answer is they wouldn't. Now, this next section talks about some things that have been discussed, again, on multiple channels, places like Midnight's Edge. You know, Tom and Andre, they take a business approach to things much like I do. So make sure you check them out if you haven't already. Uh, I wind up on their channel fairly regularly these days because we have these kind of discussions. But this talks about the what I call the downline distribution, the secondary, the tertiary, and so forth distribution of a film once it has been released in theaters where does it go from there what is the revenue stream okay <clears throat> theatrical zero to three months and again zero to three months three months is you know back pre-pandemic that was probably about right some some movies made it longer than that uh home video three to nine months meaning hey you know we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start selling this stuff on blu-ray or 4k or dvd premium tv network that's your HBOs, your Showtimes, your Cinemaxes, Stars, things like that. And then 27 months to eight years, basic free TV network. Of course, there are some movies that hang around forever. One of the great examples I always love to use is A Christmas Story and National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. We're 30 years removed from those movies being shot, filmed in the can, in the theaters, and, and on television, and they're still there. And every year, they still make bank. You want to think of something more recent? Look at a lot of the Will Ferrell movies. How many times can you run through your cable guide or your satellite guide or whatever streaming service guide that you have that delivers traditional linear content to you where you don't see something like Talladega Nights, the story of Ricky Bobby, or Step Brothers or stuff like this? It's We're 10 plus years removed from these films and they're still running consistently on these network television channels. That is a huge revenue source. But again, that doesn't make a movie a box office win or lose. That's just post box office revenues that that the theaters or uh, excuse me, that studios do look at long range to figure out where can we get money from this thing. But that doesn't, like I said, that does not that does not play into the calculations on whether a movie is a box office win or a flop slash fail. And we'll get into that more. We'll talk about Shang Chi. It's coming up. All right, for a couple of final segments for this first part of this entire discussion, and again, there will be a part two coming up in a couple of days that we'll release. Uh, but for now, I want to stick with this. And I, again, this is a setup for what's coming next because it's just simply too much information to, to, to really dive into in a single video. It really needs to, maybe three, we'll see. But here we go. During the crisis... Video on demand has emerged as a viable way for studios to reach movie fans while also posing a challenge to the traditional windowing system in theaters. Again, PVOD movies are available on subscription streaming services where the customers can view them at launch for an additional price of around, and, and this is an average, US $20, often double the average theater ticket price. But, and this is key, this is very key, significantly less than the average U.S. $35 a typical family might pay at the box office. Now, again, at the box office, we're talking about three to four people in an average U.S. family. We're also talking about that revenue being split between matinee-style movies where the ticket prices are obviously much cheaper than, uh, than, than, than uh, excuse me, or daytime movies versus matinee movies, much cheaper than the nighttime movies. So you have to take that into account when people go see films. During the early phase of COVID-19 stay-at-home orders, Deloitte found that 22% of consumers had paid to rent or watch a PVOD movie. And 90% said they would do so again as the pandemic has continued, studios have released more movies via PVOD and viewership has grown. As of October 2020, 35% of consumers say they have watched a PVOD release. And I can guarantee you those numbers have increased dramatically in the past year since this study was, was, uh, uh, was, was compiled and published. Here's some, one last thing on this that I want to go into is this paragraph here for this video. Perhaps the biggest question 
is whether studios can get the same revenues from PVOD they do from theaters. One benefit of PVOD is that studios can get a larger share of the revenue. And we know what that is at this point. It's between 80 and 85% because for studios like Disney or, or HBO Max or things like this, when they when they put those movies on there, if they charge a premium, which actually HBO Max does not, we'll get into that in the next video. Um, but for Disney Plus, if they put a thirty dollar movie out there, like Black Widow, for example, most recently, Disney is keeping about eighty to eighty five percent of that, depending on their contractual agreement with whatever delivery service they are going through. So if you have an Amazon Fire TV stick, if you have a Roku. If you have an Apple TV, when you purchase that Disney PVOD movie like Black Widow through one of those devices, okay, they are splitting that revenue with Amazon, with Roku, with uh, Apple TV. They're getting a cut. They're not keeping all of it. They're keeping definitely more than they would get in the theatrical release system, but they are not keeping all of it. With PVOD, that share is close to 80%. Studios could reduce the cost of theatrical distribution by shortening those windows to favor a PVOD release. A recent agreement between a major theater chain and a studio reduced the theatrical window to 17 days, after which movies would be available on PVOD with theaters under pressure. Studios could negotiate lower revenue share or lower guarantees. And that, folks, that, folks, right there is where I'm going to leave it because that is key and no pun intended that is paramount because that's what's going to lead us into our next second part of this discussion because these traditional models of movie studios getting 75 percent of revenues for the first 17 days these traditional models of disney reportedly getting up to 90 percent of the theatrical release grosses in the first week for major tentpole pieces like Infinity War Endgame, buddy, those days are gone because they're not doing this anymore. And theaters are in a much stronger negotiating position. And until next time, take care.